A colleague of mine described the last church year as a year that stretched from Ferguson to Charleston. Indeed, my my first year of ministry here with you in Chapel Hill began with the attention of the nation focused on those tense protests in the streets of Ferguson last August, following the killing of Michael Brown. And the church year concluded in June, the Sunday after a white supremacist slaughtered nine churchgoers at an evening Bible study at a historic African-American church in Charleston. If there was one thing that defined that last year, for me at least, it was attention. Attention to the sickening and senseless impact of law enforcement on black and brown lives in our country. Of course, the stories that we focused on, death of Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Walter Scott and Freddie Gray, Those stories are just a handful of the hundreds of injuries and fatalities that happened at the hands of police in our country every single year. An average of three police fatalities, three fatalities at the hands of police every day. They're only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the millions of interactions with police police each year in which racial bias plays a role in how people of color are policed, These stories are emblematic of a criminal justice system in our country that imprisons more than a million and a half people of color. These stories illustrate the striking racial disparities in the criminal justice system that disproportionately polices, frisks, uses force against, fines, confiscates the property of, detains, incarcerates, tortures, kills, and violates the constitutional rights of people of color. If only the end of the last church year had meant the end of stories like these, and sadly we know it did not. This summer was punctuated, perhaps most notably, by the mysterious death of Sandra Bland in Texas in which a traffic stop for changing lanes without signaling, a traffic stop for changing lanes without signaling escalated, landed her in jail where she was found dead in her cell three days later. How many people, how many white people do you know who've ever been pulled over for changing lanes without signaling? In response to events like the killing of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, a grassroots protest movement emerged in our nation claiming the name Black Lives Matter, a phrase that was created originally as a Twitter hashtag following the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the killing of Trayvon Martin. This movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, is a decentralized network of groups of activists from around the country who call attention to these senseless deaths at the hands of police and organize and agitate for the eradication of racist practices and policies in law enforcement, in the criminal justice system as a whole, and in the economic structure of society. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that it has to teach us. I'm going to talk about ways in which we can become credible allies in the work of racial justice. And in fact, in your order of service, don't, don't read it now, but you can take it with you. There's, I, I provided the copy of um, the Unitarian Universalist Action of Immediate Witness Statement from General Assembly calling on all Unitarian Universalists to become active and credible allies in the work of racial justice. And I want to begin by talking about Black Lives Matter by talking about the name itself, those three words. Black Lives Matter. They're important words. They're bold. They're out there. They take up space. They declare that in the face of a system of structural racism and structural white supremacy, a system that devalues black lives, that treats black lives and brown lives and Latino, Latina lives and native lives as cheap and dispensable, that black lives actually really, truly do matter. And it's a phrase that evokes reaction. You put the phrase on a yard sign, as members of our church have already done, and your yard sign may get vandalized or stolen. 
You put the phrase on a sign outside your church, as hundreds of UU churches in our country have done. I included a picture of one of those churches on the front cover of your order of service. And the sign is liable to be spray-painted, as it was done in Reno, Nevada, or have the word black literally cut out of the sign, as was done twice in Bethesda, Maryland. I think you're doing something important when you touch a nerve like that. Some people feel so threatened by the slogan Black Lives Matter that they feel the need to censor or qualify or edit the phrase. A UU minister friend of mine said, there is nothing wrong with saying all lives matter except for its striking tone deafness and its utter failure to be in solidarity with communities of color. It's striking tone deafness and utter failure of solidarity. And maybe I'm belaboring this point, but I want to take each of these separately. Striking tone deafness. Why is it important to actually say black lives matter? It's been explained to me this way with a couple of analogies. Suppose you are at a restaurant with four other people, and you all order your meals. The server brings out four meals for the other people, but your meal does not come. And so eventually, while waiting, you speak up and you say, excuse me, I would, I would like to receive my meal. Now imagine one of the people sitting at the table with you, already eating, interrupts and says, well, don't make this about you. Everyone should have enough to eat. All diners matter. This is absurd, of course. But if your friend said that to you, it would, it would profoundly deny what you were experiencing. The reality is you didn't get your food. Saying that all people should have food doesn't in any way advance the cause of justice in this particular case. It doesn't get food for the person who isn't eating. Or suppose you see a woman holding a sign that says, equal pay for women. Now, now try going up to that woman and saying, you should change that sign. I don't know why you want just women to be paid equally. Everyone should be paid equally. Your sign should say equal pay for all. That woman is going to say something to you, and it's probably not going to be... <laughs> it's, it's probably not going to be, thank you, O oh wise one, for showing me the error of my ways. In telling you off, she's probably going to say just a few choice words. But if you listen carefully, those words will tell you that you've utterly failed to acknowledge the reality of the injustice she is facing, that you don't get it, that you're part of the problem, not part of the solution, and that you have failed to hear and understand what's being communicated. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a first principle that affirms the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The inherent worth and dignity of every person. In so many words, our first principle is that all lives matter. In so many words, our first principle is that all lives matter. That's what the inherent worth and dignity of every person means. But here is what's important to note. Universal statements are in no way threatened by particular statements. Universal statements derive their truth from particular statements. All lives can't matter. All lives can't matter until and unless black lives matter. To try to rewrite black lives matter is a form of tone deafness. It's also a failure of solidarity. To be allies to people of color, to be in solidarity with justice movements, the very first thing we have to do is accept the leadership of people of color. And since institutionalized racism and institutionalized white supremacy are still very much a part of the society in which we live, a lot of white people are unpracticed at accepting leadership of people of color. We know that a lot of white people in our country have difficulty accepting the leadership of an African-American president. But white liberals are not immune from this either. In fact, we tend to have difficulty accepting the authority of anyone else besides ourselves. It's difficult to accept another's leadership. 
I would mention that one of our truly formative moments as a religious movement came when we accepted the leadership of Martin Luther King and answered his call to come to Selma by coming to Selma. We didn't rewrite the signs that the marchers carried. We didn't insist on remapping the march route because we can do it better. No, he said, come, we came. We showed up when we were asked to show up. Following, following another's leadership is a spiritual discipline. And so if you go back to the civil rights movement and read that history, you would find lots of whites who took issue with the strategies of the civil rights movement, who believed that restaurant sit-ins were a bad tactic, or that marches were a bad tactic, or that boycotts were a bad tactic. And so when someone criticizes the tactics of Black Lives Matter, I want to say maybe people of color actually do understand what is in their own self-interest, and maybe they do understand what tactics are effective in pushing society in the direction of justice. We saw this play out over the summer when uh, Black Lives Matter activists interrupted a Democratic campaign event with Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley. The knee-jerk reaction of many was to dismiss and criticize this interruption. You don't understand. Your, your tactics are bad, which is another way of implying you're too dumb to know what's good for you, and you don't understand activism. And that's patronizing. God knows Unitarian Universalists are not immune to having issues with authority. I recently had a conversation <clears throat> with Unitarian Universalist district staff, and uh, they tell me that when they work with church leaders, <clears throat> when they come into churches, that they can't actually talk about best practices because it won't be heard. They can say literally, here's what works everywhere else. Here's what professionals who understand this deeply say. And that falls on deaf ears. They say, well, we're going to do our own thing because we know best. The truth is that white America has never proven itself to be particularly good at listening to people of color. On the issue of solidarity, here what a middle-aged African-American minister had to say at the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly about participating in Black Lives Matter. This middle-aged African-American minister said, the leadership of Black Lives Matter is black, poor, queer women. I'm not a leader in this movement. I'm a follower. I take my orders from a 23-year-old queer woman. And he said that as a way to say that wasn't easy for him. The Black Lives Matter leadership is young, overwhelmingly LGBT-friendly, and women take a strong leadership role. As we look at them today, we forget that Martin Luther King was 26, 26 when he led the Montgomery bus boycott. Forget that Jesus was a young adult. It's been asked what Unitarian Universalists can do to support Black Lives Matter, and the UUA has actually published a list of things that Unitarian Universalists can do. First on this list is to learn, to read books and articles about the realities of racial inequality and injustice as it exists today, to become conversant about the construction of whiteness and white supremacy. I challenge you to read The New Jim Crow if you've not already done so or to read ta Coates's new book, or to sign up for the Spiritual Education for Adults class I'm going to be starting in mid-September when we'll be reading anti-racist anti activist Tim Wise's book, White Like Me. Also on the list of things you use can do is to engage. We're told, make it known you are a part of this movement. Post about it on Facebook buy a yard sign or bumper sticker even though it might get stolen, put up a sign at your church, go to protests or community meetings. They're usually just a Twitter or Facebook search away. Sacrifice part of your week to let your commitment to this work be visible. We have, by the way, Black Lives Matter yard signs. I hope we have some left available for sale after the service over in the Jones Building. I'll be going to... Um, on September 3rd, 
over to Raleigh for a voting rights demonstration. I invite you to come along with me. It's good for the soul. We're invited into this work because it is in line with not only our UU values, but it's in line with the history of this church, the history of our community church. The community church was founded, was founded as an intentional, as an intentionally integrated community when the Presbyterian church in town got rid of their minister for holding integrated meetings in which African-American youth and college students socialized together. And we were founded as the first openly integrated, openly integrated church in the triangle. It's the history of our church to be outspoken and forward, to follow social movements. Our success in 2015, our success in 2015 will not be measured by how many brown faces we can get to sit in our pews, but by the damage that we can do to systems of white supremacy in our country. And as we do this, as we participate, as good allies, as good followers in this movement, this will turn not only into salvation, it'll turn into our own salvation. James Baldwin once said, whatever white people don't know about blacks reveals precisely and inexorably what white people do not know about themselves. Black Lives Matter founder Alicia Garzer said, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean your life isn't important. It means that black lives, which are seen as without value within white supremacy, are important to your liberation. Martin Luther King said, We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. I remember last month, at the NAACP press conference in Hillsboro, at which I delivered the prayer, I remember standing right behind William Barber as he spoke. And I was standing right behind him as he talked about white people who would be attending a Confederate flag rally there in Hillsboro. And as I was sitting back there and he began, I was expecting him to lay into them. But that wasn't what happened. His voice softened, his tone grew pastoral, and he explained that the agenda of the NAACP included the goal of white liberation alongside black liberation, the political and economic and soul liberation of all. I want to say that I believe that our own historical role in the town of Chapel Hill contributed to our own liberation as a church, and it's work that we need to continue, need to continue in this contemporary manifestation for the continued health of our souls. Amen, and blessed be, and thank you. Let's sing to close the service. I invite you to rise. In